everyone and welcome to Booked Solid. We are your host, I'm India. And I'm Soraya. And for today's episode, we are going to be covering Love is a Revolution by Renee Watson. And as always, don't forget, if you're on Apple Podcasts, to leave us a rating and review. And we recently launched our Discord server, so be sure to check that out. It'll be in the link in the show notes. It's going to be replacing our Facebook group, which will be closed. And we think this will be a really great way to be able to interact with all of you. Spoiler alert! Hey guys, just as a heads up, we will be revealing spoilers in this episode. If you haven't yet read the book or seen the show or film, this is a courteous reminder to proceed with caution. So just jumping right in, um, you mentioned this before we started recording, but we actually didn't talk about this book beforehand. And so I'm itching to know (laughs) what your initial thoughts were. So something that I really did love was, okay, so um, Nala, the Robertson family, they are, well, they're from, well, the Nala and uh, Imani are not from Jamaica. I think they were born in New York, but their parents are. And I really liked that because I have family in St. Thomas and St. Lucia in the Caribbean. And so a lot of the cultures are kind of cross over. It's not the exact same, but a lot of the foods are really similar, the music. So reading it and like getting to hear them talking about music and food and stuff, it was just making me think of my own family. And I go down there to visit them sometimes. So that kind of made it a little bit more relatable for me. And I really liked it. I was actually really craving Jamaican food after I finished. So I went and got some (laughs) yesterday. Um, But yeah, so that was really cool. That was one of um, the things I really enjoyed about the book because it just made it feel like I could see my own family in them. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. It was definitely refreshing. I feel like I rarely, I can count on one hand stories that I've read or even watched that deal with um, Jamaican characters or um, like first generation, second generation. So that was interesting. Um, I think one thing that stood out for me was like, I've said this numerous episodes by now, but yeah, I've never been to New York. So again, everything I know about New York is from media, literature, magazines, photos, like that's my idea of it. And so reading this and another thing I realized is like in my head, for some reason, New York is always cold. Like I just (laughs) associate it with freezing snow because like I've seen snow. I can count on one hand, uh, maybe two in my life that I've seen snow or been in snow. Um, So that's like what I associate New York and just the East Coast with in general. So I forget it can be blazing hot in summer. And so reading this, I thought of one of my favorite movies, Do the Right Thing by Spike Lee. It also takes place, I think they're in Brooklyn though, Um, but it's summer in New York. And so that, I just like love that scenery. It just seems very like lively. Yeah, Renee Watson, I feel like she did an amazing job of capturing like every little detail, like this of really setting the scene um of of new york and like just and they're like uh, ty and nala's adventures mm-hmm. and just yeah she did an amazing job of really making us feel like we were in that scene with them so i liked that a lot for sure yeah um but one thing i do want to talk about i don't think this is an issue i have with renee watson i think this is just a me issue and that is I feel like I've become immune to like YA romance (laughs) and it's just, I don't know, maybe I need to like take a little hiatus and come back, even though I I haven't read many recently, but like there's certain tropes that I just can't do anymore, unfortunately. And so one of the big things with this novel is this idea of keeping a secret. And we talked about this in our Bridgerton episode a little bit. But when you keep a secret from your partner and it's this big thing and, you know, once it comes out, you know, they're going to hate you for it. And then that's like the big suspense element. And for me, I just I couldn't. No, I agree. (laughs) And I hate this idea, too, because it's kind of like as the reader or the watcher, you're kind of it wants you to make the wronged person forgive them or you like want the wrong but it's like you know you know what that person did was substantially wrong it was really hard reading the first three quarters of this book when she's Mm -hmm. lying to him because i first of all lying is one of my biggest pet peeves like if you lie to me that's a really hard thing to recover from because how do i ever believe anything you ever say to me and so i wrote like i'm cringing so hard watching her lie to him (laughs) and 
why would you compromise parts of yourself for someone else to like you? Like, it's just not worth it. And you're setting your relationship up for failure because you're going to continue to fake yourself. She's Mm -hmm. pretending to be a vegetarian. She's pretending to really be active and like, and care about all these social justice issues. So he's going to fall in love with some fake person. And so your relationship completely disingenuous or you come clean, which you should do, but then you've completely compromised the trust in that relationship. Like if you really love at first sight him or whatever (laughs) you're saying and you care about somebody you don't do this to them. Mm -hmm. Like, you should care about them enough to be honest and to want to build a real relationship. And I know she's 17, but still. Like, I don't think I would have been lying. (laughs) Not even, I don't think. I know. I wouldn't have been lying to anybody like this even at 17. Like, you you have a grasp on reality. You know that that's wrong. Right. And I think, like, an interesting point was made with, you know, we understand that Nala is trying to be on this journey of self-love. But it's like you said, like, you know, the foundation and not just romantic relationships with friendships, with familial relationships. Trust is such a big thing. And like you said, like you've literally started this relationship on a lie. It's built on a lie. It's bound to crumble. We're bound to run into conflict and issues. And like, I don't know, the first time I did something like this, I was in the third grade and I had a crush on this guy. And I, all my life I've worn my brother's clothes. I just like wearing boys clothes. I don't know what that is. I just like him. So I wore his wrestling WWE shirt and my crush loved WWE. (laughs) (laughs) So he sits next to me at lunch and like, this is great, loving this. I don't know what to talk to him about. And he sees my shirt and he's like, wait, you like wrestling? Finally, I can talk to someone. I was like, yes, you can. I like, totally love <laughs> Just lying through my teeth. I could barely even name, uh, what, John Cena? That was probably it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, very quickly, I think eventually I just had to come clean. Because he was talking to me in depth about all these moves and stuff. I'm like, I don't know. This is not even my, this is not my shirt. These aren't my clothes. Um, and so, like, I get it. Like, I get trying to make someone like you and the, that pressure that you feel in new relationships. But it was just, like you said, it was physically, like, hurting me to read the first three quarters of this book for that reason. Yeah, and I don't want to make her out to be an awful person. Because, like you were just saying with your story, I'm sure we've all done stuff like yeah. that. I pretended to be interested in something, like, a little more than you actually are just because you're interested in the person you're talking to. But... I feel like she took it to another level. And like you said, you came clean pretty much like right after. (laughs) And it's like, I I just feel like she took it to another level. She said she was a vegetarian. She lied about where she was working. Mm -hmm. She lied about projects she was working on. She lied about her interest in an entire movement. Like it was all these huge fundamental things about her that drew him to her. It wasn't like a, you know, I I like to go hiking, but you hate the outdoors. Like it was like everything about her character. She didn't really tell him anything real. And I honestly don't think, I mean, I cannot speak for every person in the world, obviously, but I don't think most people would forgive that. Right. It was a lie straight from the jump, several lies. And I don't even know you. And so for him to, you know, his, this love he has for her and, overshadows his like mistrust or distrust of her now i don't know i don't think that's accurate especially since he told her one of his biggest pet peeves was being lied to Mm -hmm. or that he can't forgive a liar yes i don't think that he would have been able to forgive her and move forward because like he said he doesn't even know her so Mm -hmm. it's not like there's anything lost there but a bunch of lies. <laughs> and, like, taking that a step further, the part that really got to me, really grinded my gears, two times, he gives her a gift. And both times, she's like, this is not what I want. This is not what, you know, my first relationship. And I'm just like, Nala, you told this man this is what you're interested in. He's giving you a book of quotes because you claim to be, you know, interested in, like, their wokeness and, like, their social justice stuff. Then he gives you the, the water bottle part. Okay. I, I'm trying to like, uh, I think it could, again, like this could be a me thing and not so much with the story because like I've grown more passionate about climate change and, and I'm not perfect at all. Like by no means am I going to like sit on my high horse and be like, cause yeah, I definitely need to recycle more. I still use plastic Ziploc bags trying to get out of that. I, part of that though, in a COVID world and like with work, it just seems like it's harder yeah Yeah, it's hard but that being said like 
I remember too, like when I first moved to Southern California, I was 17 or I think I had just turned 18, moved to Southern California. And I remember I asked my first roommate, I was like, what is this thing with the water bottles? Like you guys always have your water bottles everywhere. I just like <laughs> <laughs> Yes. And I didn't get it because like where I was from, like, you know, people had, I had them in, you know, when I did sports, but it wasn't like, like everywhere on, on the bus, people have their bottles at work in class and you always hear one falling yep. over <laughs> silence in the room with how loud it is it's like a bomb <laughs> dropped and so yeah i was very confused and she's like honestly it's just convenient it's good for the environment i was like you know what that's true like let me grab and to now i probably overkill i have my water bottle everywhere it's in my bed it's in my car it's just like it's just convenient mm-hmm. um and that's just a long-winded tangent to say when he gives her the water bottle and she is livid, I was just like, Nala, you literally made him think, though, that you're concerned about, like, these issues. And the way that I was raised, if a gift is a gift. Like, you don't really, like, at least not to their face. Like, you know, you know. Yeah, you, it's the thought that counts. Right. And also, he was thinking, like... It shows that he was thinking of her because he noticed every time they hang out, she goes and buys a plastic water bottle. Mm -hmm. So, like, even the environmental aspect aside of how bad that is, it's also money you're spending. Right. So, he's like, oh, you know, I see her always buying plastic water bottles when we go to hang out for the day. Let me just give her a reusable one. Mm -hmm. And then we solve that problem. Like, two birds, one stone. Like, how are you mad about that? Right. It's someone clearly thinking, like, oh, I've noticed you need this. I bought this for you. Mm -hmm. Like, it was kind of... It was... Yeah, she wanted... It. Their problem was he wanted her to be someone she wasn't mm-hmm. and she wanted him to be somebody he wasn't. Exactly. And one of my biggest beefs with Nala was the way she kind of mocked Ty for the things that were important to him just because it wasn't important to her. But you knew who he was when mm-hmm. you went after him. You knew these are the things that were important to him. So she's always telling him throughout the book, you need to relax, you need to have more fun, not everything has to be so serious. And I'm like, well... If it's important to him, it's important to him. So, like, who are you to say, like, just let it go. Let's just watch some TV. Let's just, I just want to hang out with you. I just want to have a boyfriend. Like, this is what he wants to talk about. Because this is what he loves. Like, you, how do you police somebody that much? Like, you can't, you're going to police their personality? I don't know. Yeah, it was really, uh, and I guess it speaks again to, like, them being, I get they're teenagers. But even when I was a teenager, like, you can definitely be concerned about, I guess, more educational or, you know, adult-like topics while still having fun. And it was just like this, I don't know how to describe it, but, you know, she was so focused on fun, 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 fun. And then when she would hang out with Inspire Har- Harlem, it was almost always going to be some kind of argument or fight um, centered around, like, her not wanting to be like them but then she, i'm like so your best friend's in it your cousin's in it your boyfriend's in it like you know i just for me i was struggling to understand why she was so against like just being open-minded you know it, i'm not saying you have to like convert <laughs> to inspire harlem or whatever but i'm like they're not doing anything wrong necessarily and i mean i was a teenager like sometimes you just And I'm not saying, like, you have to just blindly follow and do everything your friends do. But I'm just like, I don't understand why you were so adamant, you know? Yeah, what does it hurt to just hear what they're saying? And what they're doing, like, like you said, it's not like it's bad. They are trying to make the world a better place. Did they always go about it in the best way? No. Imani had a tendency to be... And so did um, Toya, was that her name? Yeah. They had a tendency to be a titch judgmental and condescending, Mm -hmm. which is, like, the worst way to get someone to see your side, in my opinion. Like, if you're trying to introduce someone to something new, being like, ugh. They didn't say this explicitly, but this was, like, the vibe I got. I was like, I can't believe you're using plaster water bottles. You know how bad this off the environment? As opposed to saying, like, oh, hey, have you ever considered getting a reusable one? It'll save you money, and you don't have to worry about the plastic going into landfills. That, which way do you think people are going to be more receptive to? So, if, like, anybody trying to make me feel stupid, I'm going to shut down. I don't like that. It's very, like, instigating. Like, I just, I don't like that kind of behavior, so... I get why Nala was annoyed sometimes, but then also she herself was so stubborn. Right. Yes. That's the perfect word to describe her. It was like the stubbornness just for the sake of being stubborn. And as a fellow stubborn person, (laughs) um, I get it. But then it's also just like, 
you know, it's got to be exhausting to always be like so defensive. Mm -hmm. But to that point, you mentioned a really good point um, in that both Imani and Toya, I feel like they were definitely playing into respectability politics. And I'm just going to read dictionary.com's definition of that. They say that respectability politics refers to a set of beliefs holding that conformity to prescribed mainstream standards of appearance and behavior will protect a person who is a part of a marginalized group, especially a black person, from prejudices and systemic injustices. So, like, I like to think of it as racial elitism from Mm -hmm. the person, like, within your own racial group. Right. So, like, yeah, I feel like we're definitely playing into respectability politics because it's, like, I feel like, especially with Toya and sometimes with Imani, like you said, like, this idea that, like, I'm the good black, like, I carry myself this way, so I'm better this how, and, you know, I have natural hair, and I don't listen to rap with profanity, like... Can we... Right there. (laughs) I want to talk about the natural hair thing for a second, because there has been this kind of surge in the past few five to seven years, I would say, of, like, the natural hair movement, and I love it. Mm -hmm. I myself transitioned from relaxed to natural starting in, like, 2014-ish, and love my natural curls and have embraced them, but... My problem comes from we are now eliminating, like, and I think there's even a point about this in the book. Yeah, it's towards the end when um, Nala's starting to kind of accept herself um, and her blackness. Mm -hmm. And she, like, has her braids and she loves them and she takes them out and she straightens her hair. And then she's talking about how she's going to get another different braided style the next week. And it's like, there are some things I've seen in the natural hair movement of, like, criticizing women who decide to continue relaxing or straightening or what have you and i'm like that's not the point of it we are embracing our hair because we've been told for so long that it's not beautiful but on that same note we reserve the right to choose what makes us feel the most beautiful just because someone straightens or relaxes their hair or wears a weave or wigs or whatever doesn't mean they hate their hair Mm -hmm. doesn't mean they're self-hating black like i don't like that there are people who try to like take the choice out of it exactly because we've been but we've already been policed into being like you have to wear your hair straight and relaxed to be professional why does it have to swing to the opposite side and be like you have to wear it curly if you love yourself Mm -hmm. like it doesn't and that's the thing that's like the the thing that like it almost brings me to tears because it's like in our own community i feel like to this day in 2021 there's still this whole idea and with respectability politics like there's nothing we can do. It does like it doesn't matter. Look at the former first lady of the United States of America, Michelle Obama. She happened to be a black woman who usually strained her hair or she would wear it like curled or like with wand curls and she her hair was always beautiful in my opinion, mm-hmm. always professionally styled and she was still getting slandered and hated. You have young girls who are going to schools with natural hairstyles like braids, twists, um, locks and they're getting in trouble getting kicked out off of extracurriculars like kicked our hair, out of school period yeah kicked out of school as if how I wear my hair has anything to do with my intellect and it just frankly it pisses me off because it's just like we can't win do so if like there's nothing we can do really that you're going to be universally accepted as we are in you know this um I guess post Jim Crow still dealing with um, systemic racism, America, and just globally, because, yeah, you can still go across the seas and still get the same hate. Um, And so it's just like, it hurts me that within, you know, your own community, there's, you're still getting slander. And I, I agree exactly with what Soraya is saying. Like, I went natural myself in high school, and it's been this huge journey. I did not actually, I mean, it's not so much I didn't like my natural hair at first. I was just like, what the heck is this? I didn't know what it was. <laughs> I, had rela- you know? I, had feel- I had relaxed my hair so long. I literally, when I started transitioning, I was like, I don't know what my own hair even looks Seriously. like anymore. I was in the third grade when I got my first chemical relaxer. And I thought, like, it changed the color of my hair. My hair is like a, a brown, reddish color from all those chemicals mm-hmm. in the, the Central Valley, California sun. And like... I thought that was my real hair color. And then, you know, I just grew my hair. I'm like, okay, so it's actually like a dark, like almost black. And got that one beat. Yep, that one beat. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And so it was this journey in self love. And like, I love that for me. And that's great. But who am I to talk down to another woman, man, anyone, and be like, you know, no, you need to conform. You need to, like, 
it doesn't matter, frankly. Like, you know, that's what their choice. That's their body. They can do what they want with their hair. And that's still beautiful. And that's, you know, it just, yeah. Everyone's on their own journey. Yeah. And, and they're, they don't. And I hate, like, I don't want people projecting their stuff onto me, too. Exactly. I've had people in my life try to tell me, like, I don't like my hair and I don't like myself mm-hmm. because I'm wearing a wig that day or because I'm wearing braids that day. And it's like, don't project your stuff on me. Mm-hmm. I love myself. I love my hair. Wearing it in a protective style doesn't mean I don't love it. It means I don't want to do it every day. Do you guys understand yeah. how high maintenance curly hair is? Like, <laughs> I just don't have the time, energy, or patience right. to be doing my hair every single day. <laughs> right. And frankly, it's fun. I think it's a form of self-expression, you know, changing up different styles, different colors, mm-hmm. textures. Like, Who do I want to be today? Yes. <laughs> we, got, we got a whole option. We got a variety. Have you seen that meme? That was like him. I want to see other people. <laughs> and it was this crow with like 12 different hairstyles. She's like, who you want to see today? <laughs> yes. Like, I just, I love it. And, you know, I think it's a very beautiful thing. And to see like hate being attached to it, it really hurts me. But also um, the whole point, I think it was early on where they were talking about like rap music and profanity. Like, again, I think... I mean, really, I just think it boils down to, like, your personal values and how you feel. But, you know, I don't think, like, the music you listen to, like, yeah, I don't think that has any reflection on your intellect or, like, you know, like, I have a college degree and I listen to something maybe I shouldn't be listening to. But, like, that, the two are mutually exclusive. Yeah, exactly. And I think we talked about this in our Such a Fun Age episode because... When Alex was sneaking into... Oh, what was the main character's name? Amira? Amira, yes. She was looking at Amira's playlist and being, like, shocked at some of the names of the songs and stuff. And she was like, I wouldn't think, like, a girl like Amira would listen to songs like that or something (laughs) like that. And it's like, what does that even mean? Like you said, what I'm listening to is no reflection of, like, who I am. It just maybe I'm in that mood that day. And, like, it just... Yeah, it's a really weird thing to try to conflate the two, I guess. Right. And yeah. Yeah, I totally forgot about that. But yeah, it's the same thing. And I mean, the only thing I could see is like, I've seen arguments that like, sometimes like if you're listening to some really, really aggressive, heavy stuff, then that could like maybe psychologically, emotionally, maybe not be good. Like if you're just surrounding yourself in like this bubble of like some really like hateful, hardcore lyrics, I get that aspect of it. But I feel like with Toya and them, like, in this conversation, it was just like, we listen to our jazz and, like, we are just so bad at it. <laughs> and, like, the point you were just making about surrounding yourself with really aggressive lyrics, that can be true of any genre. That's true. And so yeah. they're specifically talking about, like, rap and hip-hop, I believe, in mm-hmm. this scene. But it's like, let's not forget yeah. that lyrics, those could be lyrics in any genre. So let's not vilify one over the other. Right. Especially the one that's heavily associated with the black community. Exactly. Because then we have this, you know, vilifying the music and then the people and yeah, it's just all bad. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. One thing I will say that I did like about the story is, okay, so as unbelievable as it was to me for Ty to take Nala back, I did like that she broke up with him even Mm -hmm. like even after he said he wanted to give the relationship another chance because I'm liking it. We talked about this in the Bridgerton episode. I'm glad we're starting to see stories with people choosing themselves <clears throat> and what's best for them instead of having a significant other. And I don't mean that in a selfish way, but like, I feel like it's really normalized to this idea that you have to be with somebody or you have to have a significant other. Mm-hmm. And I honestly feel like there's a lot of work that we have to do on ourselves as individuals if you're trying to be in like a committed relationship. And Nala you know, this is a story about a young girl finding herself. She didn't know who she was, what she wanted, you know, and I think that's really dangerous to get into a serious relationship when you're at that kind of point in your life because it's very easy to just fall into that person and to do what they want to do and, you know, follow their interests, their likes, their passions without ever really knowing yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think she made the right decision. Like, she can't be open and honest with him if she can't even be open and honest with herself. Right. And he's saying, I want to get to know you. She's like, I don't even know who that person is. Right. So I do think that was a good call there. The fact that they get together anyway, ultimately, I'm kind of conflicted. Because on the one hand, like, I don't think learning and growing and working on yourself is like 
a finite thing. Like, you do it for a month and you suddenly know yourself and everything's great to go. I feel like it's a lifelong thing, obviously. Right. Like, we're always going to be learning, changing, and evolving. So, I do feel like when you get to a point where you feel secure in yourself, then it is okay to, like... And I'm not... Like, I don't have the rule book on relationships. I'm just saying it's my own personal opinion. Is like, she got to a point where she did have a deeper understanding of herself and... I can see then, like, okay, like, with maybe what Renee Watson was trying to say is, like, she has a more secure sense of self, so she can now open herself up to someone else and Mm. continue to grow. So, on the one hand, I feel like like that. But then, on the other hand, it was only, like, what, two months? Right. It's not a long time. (laughs) And so, I don't know. It just, I'm conflicted. Yeah. Yeah. I feel the same way. I was, I, I don't know. Like, even though I was bracing myself the entire story for them to break up, I was still hurt when they broke up. And, mm-hmm. like, it was really sad. And I think they are at, like, the outside um, film screening. Um, or maybe it was inside. But oh, that was, like, when they had that big fight. Yeah. yeah. So, like, when they had the initial blowout. And, yeah. So, like, I was sad. But I completely agree. Because, I don't know. I think there's this misconception, especially in young relationships, that, you know, you're trying to make like you're a half and then your partner's a half and you're trying to be a whole together Mm -hmm. but it's not the case at all because it's two whole people who just are you know mutually making each other's lives better complement each other yeah just complimenting each other it's not like you're not you know this whole once you're together kind of thing so i think yeah she definitely had a lot of self-work to do and i'm glad she was able to do that and it was just like beautiful like her journey she loved music and like um I really like, yeah, like the attention to detail on her personality. She liked makeup, clothes, like she was very... It was a part, she tried to do a twist out and it failed and I was like, <laughs> ah! all too relatable. <laughs> that part, I was like, oh no, this is giving me flashbacks. <laughs> but yes, it was very relatable and, you know, it's it was a treat to be on this like self journey with her. Um, yeah, I don't know. Is it believable that they get back together at the end? Like... It is, like, a happy story kind of moment, but um, I don't know. Maybe th- maybe it would have been better for them to be apart as she continued to, like, learn more about herself. And I guess to that point, too, like you are saying, is any YA romance believable? <laughs> <laughs> it is, like, part of the genre. Right. And um, I, I, something I wrote in my notes when I finished is, like, I love this story because, like, what or what I love about the story is that it's a young black girl trying to figure out who she is Mm -hmm. in a world that so often tries to take that journey and that choice away Mm. and like she had all these external factors trying to make her be something else you know she felt pressure from her cousin she felt pressure in a way i think from her mom from her grandma from ty and like she needed to know who she was with all of those kind of things aside just Mm -hmm. in a vacuum who am i who who is nala And, like, for my own self, I know, like, growing up, whenever I expressed interest in certain things, or because things I did, people would be like, oh, you're whitewashed, you want to be white, or you're so bougie, or you're this, you're that. And I'm like, they're basically implying there's only one way to be a black woman or a black, young black girl. Mm -hmm. And it really infuriated me because it's like, I'm just trying to be Soraya. Like, just because I like this or I want to do that doesn't mean that I'm trying to be somebody else Mm -hmm. like i'm just trying to be me and saying that like that implication is just like oh we're all just one homogenous group of people like we're not all unique individuals with unique tastes and likes dislikes personality traits like i hate like oh yo you don't want to be black what does that even mean like there's one way to be black right it's such a narrow-minded way of thinking and i hate it when people would say stuff like that to me yeah let's talk about that like this monolithic (laughs) the universal black (laughs) <laughs> like you must check xyz boxes to be said black person I'm like what like frankly it's bizarre like we don't see that in any ethnicity that exists there's no one way to be a person and i think that's it's really sad and it, of course it, t- it just di- it directly goes back to slavery that whole mentality can be traced to slavery and it's just remnants of that that we're still seeing in our modern contemporary society but i will say like Uh, In my experience with that, and it's like, it's not even always strangers. Like, it could be, you know... Oh, these are people in my life. Yeah, like, people in my life. Like, I remember when I was in the third grade, I switched to, like, we moved to a more suburban neighborhood. And at that time, I mean, I was a whole kid. (laughs) I was, like, eight, nine. 
And I use a lot of slang. I guess my diction wasn't really that proper, quote unquote. And like, this was like a really difficult time because, you know, as a small kid in a predominantly white school or institu- institution, um, like the teachers were constantly policing my vocabulary, saying like, you're not speaking correct, you need to speak. So like, this became a thing that was heavily on my mind. Then flash forward to high school, I was in mock trials, kind of like debate. So like speaking is the thing, that's like the sport. <laughs> and so like, we paid a considerable amount to our diction, to our speech, what we're saying, how we used words, how we use intonation and pauses and like, it was a lot like at one point one of the coaches told me like I think you know we broke you like I think we made you a robot like you got to be more personable and so my whole life it's been this journey of you know how I'm speaking there's also code switching yeah you know there's just that like and that's that there's nothing wrong with that that's you know common amongst a lot of different ethnicities um but to that point like people in my life um have told me like you know, you're speaking too proper. You're speaking white. Like, it's, you know, yep. it's because you're reading all them books or something. I'm like, what does that mean, though? Like, let's let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. What does that mean? You know, what are you saying when you say this? So because I'm speaking like, quote unquote, proper, this is deemed negative. But to you, proper is using, I don't know, some like bigger vocabulary occasionally. So black people can't do that. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, you're just furthering the stereotype. Exactly. It's being perpetuated. And in my case, like these were fellow black folks. So I'm like, we're perpetuating negative stereotypes, which means we've internalized this. And it's just tearing apart our community even further for what? Mm -hmm. Like we're not. And again, with respectability politics, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I carry myself a certain way, dress a certain way, am a part of a certain socioeconomic class, you know, it doesn't matter because slang India and, you know, um, job interview India, I'm still going to face the same discrimination, microaggressions, um, you know, I just think ultimately you should just be you, you know, like we were saying earlier, just be comfortable in yourself and um, I've, I've gone off on a tangent now, but yeah, that idea of like you're acting white, like we gotta we really gotta stop that we no, really yeah. got to <laughs> and i was saying two things on that too that exact same slang that you were probably getting policed and critiqued for using is exactly what certain groups of people are using today and it's hip and edgy and fun right and b i've learned like people are always going to have something to say like that's a lesson that i have learned because i have had this thing my whole life where i like need to be liked same and my mom would tell me as a kid like some people just aren't gonna like you and I'd be like, oh, clutch my pearls, what? Like, what do you mean? Some people, even if you're super nice and you're this and then that, and she's like, people just aren't going to like you. And you just have to be okay with that. And it is, like, it's true. People just won't like you. I can't please everybody. So honestly, if people are always going to have something to say, you may as well do and say the things you want to do. Wear what you want to wear. Act like how you want to act. Because if people are going to say stuff about it, at least you're being true to yourself. Like, exactly. it's just too tiring to try to please everybody all the time exactly it's 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 actually impossible (laughs) you know because under that assumption everyone would be there's this fairly odd parents episode where like like the world turned gray and like everyone was the same so it'd be like that like everyone's the same so there's this one universal person so you have to like ascribe to that that's not the case it's not and it's like and i would be a hypocrite too because there are people that i don't like you know like and not to be like rude but there's just certain people you know you don't vibe with personality whatever and i'm sure they're perfectly lovely people but we just don't click and like that's how some people feel about me and that's okay too yeah yeah no i agree Um, But really quickly, before I forget, I want to get your opinion on Imani. Um, Just as we were talking about uh, Nala's relationship with Ty, something that I couldn't figure out for the life of me, it just was her being a hater. That was like my final conclusion. But I couldn't understand why she was so against Nala being with Ty. And like she tried to play it off as Ty's my friend, but I'm like, I've been in friend groups though like we and maybe it just like wasn't the backstory like maybe that wasn't established enough but I'm like I don't in my head like Imani's always with um Asher I think Mm -hmm. her boyfriend or Sadie or Toya like she's not out here hanging out with Ty Mm -hmm. so I'm like what is this you know hang up yeah I did not understand and I'm actually glad you brought that up because I kind of forgot she kept doing that and I was like I guess we're gonna get an answer later and then we never did so is she like I almost feel I guess what I would attribute it to is 
that kind of argument they have at the end where Imani feels like she always has to look out for her or she's kind of like the role model so to speak maybe it's her in her own mind I feel like Imani kind of thought she was better than Nala yeah. she had the steady boyfriend she was really active in the community she was very secure in her sense of self and so to see Imani or I'm sorry to see Nala have a relationship and like have this great guy going after her maybe she was feeling threatened and like I'm supposed to be like better than Imani or better than Nala all the time I don't know. That's the only thing I can really think of is maybe that's what it was. Yeah. I just... It was really disappointing. Like, I I just wanted them to be cool again. And then I, about halfway through the story, I realized, like, I don't really see that happening. Especially once they get into that big fight and they're at their grandma's house and they just don't speak. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been there. Like, that That was definitely, like, a little nostalgic moment like that. No. Like, I, we both have our, you know, shoulders crossed and we're not looking at each other. And, like, I get that. But it was just... It was disheartening. Because at the end of the day, you have two, like... I imagine at one point they were probably the closest to each other and now like they can't speak to each other and I I felt like with Imani like to me it was almost like jealousy but I didn't understand it because I'm like you're in this happy committed relationship like because she kept saying comments like why would Ty he's with you yeah she's like oh wow (laughs) my cousin is dating Ty and then I was like is it because she's close to Toya and she knows Toya likes him and it puts her in a weird position maybe but It was, and that's something I kind of didn't like, is I felt like the other characters outside of Nala were kind of flat. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a lot of depth. And I think the book really could have benefited from having alternating, like, alternating points of view between chapters. So if we'd gotten a couple from Imani, first person, and Tai, I feel like that would have helped me to understand some of their decision making a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Because we're only getting Imani's feelings and actions through Nala mm. and I just feel like it kind of made her look like not the nicest person like I felt mis- I felt myself getting really frustrated with her a lot mm-hmm. like why are you bailing on your cousin why are you treating her this way like when Toya embarrassed Nala like that at the Inspire Harlem event I'm like do you even care yeah where like, was the empathy yeah so there was just a lot of stuff she did that made me mad and so I would have appreciated kind of getting in her head and seeing why she did what she did yeah I agree. It's just, like, I had so many questions, like, you know, and even with Nala, I was like, what happened with your mom, you know? Like, that's a big thing to just walk out at 13 and just never move back in. And from what I understand, Nala's an only child. And I thought that they were, like, they weren't on speaking terms, but then to find out that they are and, like, you know, her mom is making an effort with, like, back-to-school supplies, stuff like that, and then... Like, they are talking, but she's just like, I simply cannot live with you. And her mom's like, okay. Like, that's major. Yeah, we never get any insight into, like, hey, what's up with that? Yeah. Or even with, you know, Ty, like, like you're saying, like, he felt a little, he was a little lackluster. Like, we get it. You're the, you're the good guy. But he had, like, that's it. I feel like all he could talk about was reusable water bottles. <laughs> and... <laughs> Um, community blog parties yes and the, her photo project yes Those are the only three things they ever talked about and like he just felt flat yeah but i'm like we did get those glimpses into like his troubled relationship with his father mm-hmm. like what was going on with that and like i don't know i was telling sarai before we started recording i wish he had like a sibling like i think that would have been cool like a little brother little sister and like seeing um through their eyes his relationship with nala like i don't know I think that was just something like I needed more because then it's just kind of like I don't really care you know like with Imani I was just like yeah I don't really like this character but I think Sarai you brought up a good point because it's like maybe I didn't like her maybe I just didn't understand her actions because we did start to see that towards the end like with their fight like um in Imani's mind I'm pretty sure events played out much differently than in Nala's but we yeah. only get Nala's POV so it looks like Imani's just this bully but it's like you know why you know why does she feel like she can't be at home in her own house for like weeks at a time she's just like Asher's Asher's you know I can't be here like Toya and so it's like well what's going on you know and then like yes we know she feels like Nala's taking her parents away but I I I beg to differ. (laughs) And, like, I guess to have... I mean, I know, they're teenagers, so, you know, teenagers aren't always the most... 
we t- t- they can be a little self centered in in their thinking. So I know I'm sure Imani's only thinking about how this affects her, yeah, how her life has changed. But it's also on the flip to look at um, Nala's perspective, and even you know, as an adult, it's hard for me sometimes to see other people's point of view because you do. You're like, oh, this is so terrible for me. Yeah, and then I'm the like, main character. Yeah, I'm the main <laughs> character. but like, no, to pull yourself out of it and look at it as a whole, like, think about from Nala's perspective how painful that must be to not have this relationship with her mother. You know, that she, it's so bad, she can't live with her. And, you know, like, that's something that's probably very painful for her. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for her to have a place where she can be loved and taken care of by her aunts and uncles, like, if Imani looks at that without considering herself, she should probably be, like, grateful or happy they can be there for her when Mm -hmm. she has no one else. Because if she wasn't there, where would she go? Right. So it's it's hard. It, and I'm like, I'm not saying I'm perfect. And I'm like, oh, yes, I'm always, you know, thinking <laughs> of everyone else. But it's just, it helps sometimes to put things in perspective. Yeah. Like, not be so, like, self-concerned. Exactly. Um, but I do have a question for you. Or, mm-hmm. pro- like, a, I want to get your opinion on this. I really thought, in my mind, that... Like, this whole thing with, like, Nala visiting her grandma. Um, I believe she lives in, like, a senior living community kind of thing. And, like, yeah, with this photo project, you know, she's fighting with Miss Sharon, who works at the front desk, who's just Miss Attitude. (laughs) And so, like, you know, it becomes pretty apparent that it's going to be a challenge to, like, do this photo project, which was a good idea. Uh, And then it just doesn't happen. (laughs) Okay. That's what bothers... Okay. I really thought, because obviously we see she's on this journey um, of growth, trying to find who she is. And actually, um, I should have mentioned this when we were talking about it before, but I'll bring it up right now. And it was a quote from the author, from Renee Watson, in an interview she did. She was asked what she wanted readers to get out of this book. And she said, I want readers to walk away from this book understanding love is a radical act in a world that's constantly policing the existence of black girls and women it's a radical thing to say i am enough Mm. and that really sums up you know this book and i love that because that's exactly what i got from it and how i felt of like we are constantly being told we need to be only one kind of person or we can only be one kind of person and so i'm like okay the whole point is her going on this journey so she comes up with this idea because of ty which i did love like he pushed her to see things she might not otherwise have seen or done and she's on this you know path i thought the big thing was going to be her achieving this goal right completing the project because the first time like like change isn't easy so the first time when she goes to pitch the idea and gets immediately shut down And she just gives up. Like, I thought the book was going to show her, like, continuing to go back or, you know, like, her grandma fighting and saying, like, no, I'm going to do this. And then it ending with her completing it. Like, I feel like that would have been a better metaphor for what she was going through the entire book than what she ended up doing. Right. Long-winded way of answering your question, but yeah. <laughs> no, you're you're good. Yeah, I I have to agree. And even look at the title, Love is a Revolution. Like, revolution is in the title. With revolutionary acts comes, you know, fighting, up for, fighting for yourself. Because what she was proposing, literally painting a wall and putting up some frames, like, you know, I just, I would have liked to see her, okay, well, can I set a meeting with your bosses? Like, she even mentioned that at one point. And that just didn't happen. And I feel like, you know, it would have been a great opportunity to, like, teach Nala about community organizing and say she had the other senior citizens living in that community gather behind her and say, we support this idea. We're going to assist her. We're going to help, you know, gather photos to help her. Like, this is our community. And seeing, you know, this group of, I'm assuming, um, yeah, because where they're at, it's a predominantly black area. Like, a group of black folks gathering for a mutual cause like this is a revolution <laughs> and to that point i love that you said that because there's a point where um nala like internally she's thinking about the project when she first thought of it and she says something along the lines of it's not as big or as important as what ty is doing with inspire revolution or inspire harlem but it's something and i wrote like Anything that you do that you're passionate about to make a positive change is big and important. Mm. I didn't like that she was comparing her act to what Ty was doing and saying, like, well, it's this little thing. But, like, no, this is going to improve the lives of people. You care about it. It's about contributing to something larger than yourself. That is big and important. Mm -hmm. And so I would have loved to see that kind of parallel of showing there are many different ways to be an activist. There are many different ways to start a revolution, so to speak. And I feel like that would have been the perfect ending. Like, there's no cookie cutter way to be the right kind of black person like exactly what the whole book of what she's saying like 
then she feels threatened by Inspire Harlem. She feels guilty or not even guilty, but like feels like they're attacking her for not being as woke as them. But I feel like this would have been the perfect way to show there's just not one way to be woke to be right. or not even woke but there's not one way to like make a change to make a change yeah exactly exactly yeah and then even just like looking at because my whole thing was like oh i was getting so stressed out when like they go to that thrift store and they start getting all these supplies <gasps> of like first of all y'all where's the money going i was thinking that too i was like the shit doesn't work you don't yeah work. so endless supply of cash we're doing all these dates in like new york in the summer we're spending all this money but okay that's great love that for y'all but when they go to this thrift store and they get all these frames and then they go to the like party store and they're i'm like they go to like yeah they go to like four stores that day and i'm like please come clean yes and so but then this was part of the confusion because they have like this big end of the year meeting with inspire harlem or not meeting but like a celebration and they get like um certificates and nala says that she gives i guess she gives part of the supplies but she keeps the frames but i didn't understand that she kept the frames i thought she gave them the frames she was curious to see like what their um like teacher did with it but then she goes on to say she kept the frames and then she she did like this cute little like memorable sentimental thing with them but then we don't actually see her like give any of the gifts yeah. and so i was like it would have been nice to like imani give her like i don't know sadie's like all these characters her grandma um even ty ty's mom <laughs> no maybe not ty's mom but. yeah but no you're right because she even like comes up with the idea when she hears her aunt say cause she gives her aunt the photo album as a birthday gift and says like oh it's the little things and she's like the little things and that's when she gets mm-hmm. the idea to make it And so even seeing her give those out, it would have been right back to our point of no gesture, like no matter the size of the gesture, is still big and important. Mm -hmm. So like going out of your way to do this for the people in your life and make them feel special, even that would have been better than the kind of like anticlimactic thing with the the picture project. (laughs) Yeah, you know, I don't know. There's a lot to like. I'm just sorry. I'm just going through my notes. No problem. Oh, I have a quick little question. I don't know why this is stressing me out so much, um, but, like, her grandma's boyfriend, <laughs> like, he, so he has, like, I was, like, is he pre-diabetic or is he just watching his sugar? Because I was, like, Nala. Please you- stop bringing him ice cream <laughs> if he's pre-diabetic. I was thinking yes, the same thing. I was getting really stressed because I'm, like, well, this, like, at first it's, like, cute, okay, but I'm, like, dang, every week? Like, mm-hmm. I don't think this is good. He's already drinking the sweet tea. Yeah. <laughs> exactly and i want to say for all my critiques like and i think it's important to critique anything yes um and you know for my critiques like there is a lot about the book i did appreciate and the author renee watson herself in that same interview she said i'll actually link it below because i really um liked it but she said black kids need to see themselves falling in love having fun and being a teenager not always having to raise their voice about something or be teaching a white person how to be an ally Mm. and i love that because and indy and i've talked about this extensively but i'm tired of black stories centering on trauma and pain you know it's about like in the shows that do so well the movies they're about slavery they're about black people being wrongfully accused Mm or i'm thinking about just mercy or the central park five and like it's always about pain and trauma but like we are real people okay we fall in love we work we go to school we go through the trials and tribulations of life just like anybody else and i just want more stories of black people just living their lives and not to say those stories are not important you know stories about our history because that is a part of of history here in this country for us I'm not saying it's not important because it definitely is. I just, there needs to be a wider variety of stories available to us. Like, I don't want to only see pain and trauma. I need right. to see happiness and joy. And there's actually um, something else she said I really liked. Let me find it. Okay, yeah, she said, keeping it real as a realistic fiction writer means telling the truth. And the truth is there's a thing called black joy. I want to ensure that our young people have books that display that. Mm. Wow, yeah, I have to say, like, and um, exactly what you said, you know, just because we're critiquing it, I mean, everything that I consume, I think we should, frankly, like, that should be a habit to just critique any media because, you know, it's important to, like, challenge yourself and think critically about what you're consuming, what messages you're digesting, 
Um, but yeah, like I, I was just thinking when I was reading this, you know, at 23, I still got some joy out of it, but like 16 year old me, even the cover, like can oh, we just talk cover. about the cover? So it's a great cover. Yes. Uh, and even the color is so pretty. I put it mm -hmm. on my shelf and I was like, I don't think I have any books that are this color. It's like a bright green. If you haven't seen oh. it, uh, like, I mean, I, you, I know you've seen it, but like yeah. other people who read it, <laughs> but yeah, it's like a bright green and Nala's on the cover wearing like this bright yellow shirt and it's just like pretty and happy and yeah and just yeah. seeing a black girl on the cover like yes i i am bummed i had to i ended up getting the ebook um but just when i see it on my <laughs> on my screen like mm -hmm. i'm still i love it and it's just um i don't know there's a lot of research on this i learned about it in school maybe i could like link an article um but like this is like not just my personal opinion there's statistics on this in social studies but like historically black women in particular are ranked i guess lower in terms of desirability or like in just finding romantic companions and again traces back to slavery but like specifically if we look at western beauty standards typically it's not going to be uh black people in mm -hmm. general right and so with that we have this huge gap in media and like sarah said like we go ham on this topic like we we've talked about it and i think you guys if you're long time listeners you probably know how we feel about it but it just goes to say like it's so important and it was nice like even with like you know little bones to pick i had with the story just seeing you know a black woman who happens to be plus sized you are desirable you are worthy of love like you know your external has nothing to do with your internal like you're still you know attractive or whatever or you're still lovable like you know whether that be romantic familial friends like you know there's like this gap in media just like we don't want to show black people being loved like what is with that yeah and i actually liked too that her weight wasn't a big part of the storyline it wasn't mm -hmm. her accepting and loving herself for her weight and people making comments and her having no like it had really no part in the story like even when um ty says something about her being beautiful she's like I know I'm beautiful. Just because right. I'm big doesn't mean I'm not beautiful. Mm -hmm. And going back to that same article, <laughs> Renee Watson was saying um, that she said, I think about myself in the way that I was raised. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to like my body until people started telling me that. Mm. I looked at magazines and saw I was pretty much erased from existence. And there were the backhanded compliments like, you're beautiful for a big girl. And so she, just, she said, I'd like to see more representation of everyday black girls who are also big as a main character and not the side character. They get the love they wish for and their humanity is not centered on trying to lose the weight. Mm. And I do think she did an excellent job at that because it wasn't like while she was on this journey of self-discovery it had nothing to do with her weight and i feel like that's something that's very common in society is people assume like if you're a big girl or a plus size girl like you just you don't like yourself there's no right. possible way that you could be happy with your weight and you're obviously trying to lose weight and it's like uh what right like, who decide like i don't even understand how we when everyone got together and decided what an acceptable weight was and whether or not you're allowed to love yourself based on a number on a scale. Like, when did that happen? Yeah. And frankly, it's just like, it's none of your business, you know? Oh, truly. <laughs> but also, it's weird because, like, historically, um, like, these opinions about shape change so rapidly. Like, I remember when I was in high school, like, thin was in. And it was all about being as skinny as possible. And, like, I don't really want to unpack all of that because it was a lot in that period. But I think... Most of us can agree, like, in the age of Instagram and, like, with the Kardashians, like, there's been this whole movement on being, like, pro being thick and, like, you know, being, like... Which, mind you, they're celebrating the exact body type that black women have yeah. had for <laughs> centuries, but we were told we were too heavy, too fat, too this, that, and the other because people like to use fat as an insult. And, mm -hmm. like, it just... It, yeah, it's... I'm tired, quite frankly, of... Think, whew, we've talked about this a lot, but I'll say it again. I'm tired of things that black people have pioneered or just come naturally to black people being deemed as unprofessional, or unprofessional, unprofessional um, unattractive, what have you, and then being celebrated on non-black people, mm -hmm. a.k.a. the Kardashians <laughs> with their curvy body types now and their braids and their this that and the other like uh, colorful hair like all of these things that we were long nails intricate designs like all the things that mm -hmm. basically we were made to feel bad about or were told were ugly etc but are now being celebrated 
It's just very annoying. I'm tired. Right. And it's just, it's like, it's so arbitrary. Again, like you can't win. And I'm definitely going to have to check out that article because it's so true. I'm so glad that that wasn't like a big point in the story because, you know, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, that's not all there is to a person is their weight. And like, I'm so tired of these like movie shows, etc. that I've seen where it's like, so you do have like the bigger friend or the plus size friend and like their whole like they're the side character first of all they're not the main character they don't have any like like backstory they just say like funny things yeah they're there to be funny yeah they're the comic relief. yeah they're always there for the comedic relief and it's like that's so like i don't know insulting and just like dehumanizing and just reductive like we've seen this time and time again like do you guys live in the real world? <laughs> like, are you around people? And it's just and reinforcing to folks who do look like that, that like, this is your place in the society, like, which is just not the case. Like, we need more stories like this uplifting, real, everyday folks. And, you know, yeah, I just, I'll just, I'll say that till the end of time. Representation matters. It is so important. It is so crucial. And it's almost Valentine's, y'all. Like, this is the month of love. It is February. It's so nice to have, you know, a Black YA novel that isn't based in trauma, isn't focused on, you know, her physical appearance. Yeah. Yeah, and speaking <laughs> of what you're saying, too, like, um, T. Noir on YouTube actually has a great video about that. Uh, it's called the token fat friend role. Mm. Let's talk. And we'll link that below too, because that I think she did a really great job in that video talking about how harmful this is and like just dissecting it further. Um, and it's just kind of similar to what we were saying. So yeah, it's, there are a lot of things about this book that I really did enjoy and it was just refreshing. It was refreshing to see a full cast of black characters living their lives. Mm -hmm. And with differences, you know, like it wasn't just, again, the universal black. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like we have different personalities, different interests, different taste in music, fashion, hairstyles. Um, I did feel for Nala with the whole head wrap situation. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> Everything having to do with her hair, I was like, mm-hmm, yep, yeah, mm-hmm. Yes. I have to this day not been able to execute a successful twist out. I am convinced that all the girls <laughs> on YouTube, all the people on YouTube who have twist out videos and it comes out looking flawless, there's some kind of sorcery going on because the twist outs aren't possible. The twist out conspiracy. The twist out conspiracy. I cannot. Yeah. There's even like a line um, when she like she takes her braids down, she washes her hair, blow dries it, and straightens it. She and she does this in the morning. She's like, it's like two p.m. by the time I finish. Mm -hmm. I was like, it's a whole day affair. It's a whole day affair. <laughs> yep. There's uh, there's two things that she says about her hair that I love in the book. There's a part where. Every, like she first got her braids and I think it was like her first time having braids since elementary school mm -hmm. and I remember that feeling too because in elementary school I definitely was doing the whole Alicia Keys braid <laughs> situation like that was that was my go-to but then I just I started relaxing my hair in fifth grade and just stopped ever getting braids and then I got them again freshman year of high school or freshman year of college and I was like hold on a minute <laughs> like I just loved it and I felt so pretty and I just felt like why have I not been wearing my hair like this like why did I get just had just being glad that I found the style again. And so I remember when she got her braids for the first time again in the book, she was just like, there was a sentence, it was just, my hair is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And that is a simple sentence. But we have such a complex relationship with their hair. Like, I just loved seeing her realize that. Mm -hmm. And then there was, uh, at the end, she made a list of three things I love about myself. And it said, um, my hair. After experimenting with different styles, I've come to love it for the many ways it can transform and for the story it's always telling. Mm. And I was like, oh, yes, because it, it, it's just, there's so much tied up in it. And like that journey of loving your hair, accepting your hair. And it is, it does tell a story. Mm -hmm. You know, every single style I choose is saying something about how I feel that day or whatever it may be. And I just, I like that line a lot. Yeah, that's so true. Like, I don't know. I feel like as a black woman, a, bit, a major part of my identity as far as like self-expression is my hair. And like those that scene where it's her, her friend and her cousin and she's getting her hair braided by her friend. Mm -hmm. I loved like that felt it was so, and they're watching movies. It's real. It's, it's so real. real. Like I pretty much my whole life, my sister and my mom have up until recently when I moved out, um, they were always doing my hair. And like, I don't think I've ever actually been in a professional hair salon, <laughs> but like, 
I mean, never say never, but it was usually family doing my hair and now I've started doing it myself. And I guess I started to take it for granted. I'm just like, you know, they're just braids. Like I've been wearing braids a lot throughout college and post-college. And I read something like the other month and it was like, the thing about braids or like some of these styles that like I take for granted, it's like it reflects the amount of time, like, you know, like with braids and I've been wearing them like kind of long. Like if you look at them, you can think to yourself like, that's, there's a lot of time put into this hairstyle mm -hmm. and that time is like indicative of a type of beauty in and of itself and I'm like that is so interesting because I never thought about it that way I'm just like these just braids like I, frankly I don't want to do my hair I don't <laughs> want to deal with my natural hair you know like I've definitely heard comments when I take my braids out oh you should keep it like that like you know keep your natural curls <laughs> and like speaking of hold on there's actually something I bookmarked in the book that I want to discuss she, so, okay, it was right after Nala got her braids, and she's talking about how she doesn't know how people are going to react, and she's like, there's so many ways people react to a black girl changing up her hairstyle. Of mm. course, there's the most ridiculous, can I touch it questions <laughs> from white people, then there's the how long did it take question from people who know better than to ask <laughs> if they can touch it, but are still so curious. There are the black girls who've been wanting the style, or just had the style, and want to talk to you about it, compare notes on the experience. And then the people who totally ignore you act like your hair has always been that way, which means they either hate it or would <laughs> rather or would rather not say. But of course, the best response is a simple, I like your hair. Why is that response the hardest? <laughs> That's I love that passage because it's so true. Mm -hmm. If you like it, just say that. If you don't, say nothing. I, the, I can't with the, oh my gosh, I really like your hair. Is it yours? Yep. First of all, whether it's growing out of my scalp or I paid for it, it's mine. Period. <laughs> I own it either way. Second, it's none of your damn business. If you like it, like, oh, if it's not mine, are you going to like it less? Like, what is that dumb question? Mm -hmm. I just, it drives me nuts. Or, like, people are like, how long did it take? How do they do it, though? Like, I don't know, look up a YouTube video, okay? <laughs> right, why is it, why is it my, why am I suddenly a teacher in this two-second interaction while we're on an elevator? Like, why do I have to now educate you an entire history of black hair tradition? True, and I just love that, the, 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 the part where she said the best response is, I like your hair. Mm -hmm. Why is the simplest response the hardest one to give? Like, it's just so true. <sighs> and Soraya knows. I've been complaining for <laughs> a solid week now because I actually have been changing up my hair a lot. And in dealing with that comes a lot of unwanted attention and questions. And I don't really like unwanted attention or questions. And so, you know, every time it happens, I'm like, Soraya, today they said <laughs> And then I'm always flabbergasted <laughs> at the gall of strangers and acquaintances to say the things they say. Like, I would never, ever, 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 ever think about giving some backhanded compliment of, I like your hair, is it yours? Yeah, like, what? Do you realize what you're saying? And why do you feel like you could say that to somebody you don't even know? Yes, and I'm not, like, I'm not trying to be like, oh, you can never talk to me about my hair. I'm not saying that. It, you can tell where people are coming from in the way that they approach yes. it. If someone says, like, oh, I really like your hair. Oh, how do you do it? Because I've been thinking about getting it done. Mm -hmm. Or, like, something like that. Like, I would be more than happy to tell you. But when you're like, but, like, how do they? <laughs> but, like, your hair's not that long, right? Like, yeah. how do they do it? See? Like, that, it's different. <sighs> There's a different vibe there. And I just don't have the time anymore. <laughs> yeah, I really I really don't. Like, after a whole 23 years of battling <laughs> this fight, I'm done. And it's so backhanded. Like, that whole, yeah, is it yours? Because the implication of that is, like, because your real hair couldn't be that beautiful. Exactly. Or it couldn't be, like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Let's, can we talk about the weather? Can we talk about... <laughs> like, you know the ins and outs of every follicle coming out of my head? Yeah. Like, what do you even mean? And, 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 yeah, and it's also, like, that question lately, I guess I it's been so hard on me because of my own journey in, like, loving my hair and loving just, yeah, this whole, like... I literally didn't know my natural hair texture. I don't think, you know, for folks who haven't dealt with that, I don't think, like, maybe... I don't know. You can't understand. Yeah, <laughs> like, I don't know if you can realize, like, you don't know the own texture of your hair that naturally grows out. Uh, like, I was, yeah, I think I was maybe 18, 19, 
when I finally like washed my hair one day I was like what is what is this like yeah. there's curls because like there's this whole period for y'all who know who transitioned where you're growing it out and the ends were dead my ends were fried and it had you looking <laughs> wild you have this half curly half straight mess yes <laughs> and like I finally reached a point where I finally got rid of all those fried ends and I'm like this is just my hair and so now while I love my hair yeah I'll still throw on my braids or weaves wigs what have you and I still love my hair though and so this implication that like you know well you're with your you know extensions or whatever like it couldn't be I'm just like this is some hater stuff that I don't need on this journey of self-love like this is just negative energy keep that over there don't bring that in here stop projecting on me yes if you don't like maybe you need do you not love yourself (laughs) do you not love your hair like why are you accusing me of this be right you're absolutely right that's all it is is projection and I have to even as an adult I have to remind myself that and so it was like you said like having that passage in a YA book like like, it makes me happy to know my niece can grow up and read something mm-hmm. like this. My little sister. Like, yeah. It's just it, that representation. It makes my day. It does. And I want to just to the hair point really quick. There's nothing wrong either with experimenting and changing your hair. Like, right. I, I know I'm never going to have straight hair because my hair is curly. So if I want to wear a wig with straight hair just to, like, change up my look, like, what's wrong with that? Mm-hmm. Like, why is that such a problem? Yes. And since you bring, like... There's a there's a horrible misconception that like if black women want to wear straight hair or even like blonde hair or like like with what we were talking about earlier that like we're trying to like not be black like dissociate from your blackness yeah, yeah which is just frankly it's ignorant and you know do you say that to um, a girl who's naturally blonde who dyes her hair dark are you right. saying you don't want to be you know X whatever ethnicity you are like they just want a different color exactly and <laughs> there's absolutely black people or folks with melanin who have lighter hair who have blonde hair so like this idea that we, again monolith universal black <laughs> <laughs> like it's bizarre it is literally bizarre and so i yeah i really really hate that yeah there's this youtuber oh i can't remember her name now it's gonna bother me but she is black and she has naturally blue eyes and she oh gets, is it sydney yes yeah yeah yeah. and like the comments she gets of people like girl honey you'd be so much prettier with your natural brown eyes why are you wearing those contacts like it's okay to embrace your blackness like all these people coming for her like her eyes can't be blue and it's just ridiculous like why would you automatically jump to this and also if she was wearing blue contacts it doesn't mean she hates herself right it doesn't mean she hates her blackness and it's just like if like you were saying we just can't win Mm -hmm. it just feels like we can't win sometimes yeah we're always at war always at war with the world and i understand there it's gonna be frankly it's gonna take a long time for us to get to a place where we're not in this constant battle with society but in the meantime, we got to love ourselves. We got to do what's best for us because it's not it's not a fight that's ever worth fighting. It's not. So that pretty much wraps up all that we have today for y'all. Um, we really hope you enjoyed this conversation and I'd recommend to check out the book and just form your own opinions. Um, you're always welcome to chat with us. Also, don't forget to check out our next episode. It will be dropping on February 22nd and it will be on The Undoing, both the book and the highly rated HBO show. And we'll see you next episode. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us today. If you like what you heard and want to stay in the loop, be sure to follow our Instagram and like our Facebook at Book Solid Podcast. You can also check out our Discord server where you can leave suggestions, engage in discussions, and take a deeper dive into our episodes. We'll have the links to all of our social media accounts in our episode show notes.